All right, so with all the stuff happening in the real estate industry, the economy, mortgage interest rates, so many people have been asking questions about, well, what does this mean for the future of real estate agents? And mainly a lot of people are concerned that are in the industry of what, what's going to happen? What does the landscape look like moving forward? And then there's another camp of people that are considering getting into the real estate industry saying, listen, man, I don't know, is is that industry still a good idea for me to go all in with my career? And these are all great questions. And there's question, there, th these are questions that have been considered for a long time. You know, what does the future hold for real estate agents? Will real estate agents be replaced by AI? Uh, what does the landscape look like? And so today's episode, I want to get into a roundtable discussion that happens every year at Inman and what they do at the beginning of every year, or at least they did this at the beginning of this year, was they had about seven or 70 rather industry leaders to kind of discuss some high level major topics or major issues that the real estate industry is facing right now. And they looked at three primarily. One was what does the real estate industry look like after this market correction that we're going through right now? After we get the inflation under control, after mortgage interest rates maybe you know settle in what what is the what does the real estate business look like after that the second thing they looked at was what does the real estate industry look like long term you know after this pandemic after covid what does it all look like when the dust settles and the real estate market goes back to what we're calling pre-pandemic levels what do what what does the industry look like? And then the third thing they looked at was what does the real estate industry look like after a lot of these property tech companies have struggled over the past couple of years? Maybe the biggest story of them all is this life after the industry's mega lawsuits. This to me probably is the most important of all the topics discussed at this round table. And I have made many, many videos about these lawsuits because they have made they have probably the biggest implication when it comes to changing the trajectory of the real estate industry more so than anything else that they discussed. So let me just tee this up and then we'll get into some details. So as an industry transform, that's no less, so so Kendall Bonnell expects and no less than she believes brokerages should prepare for should the lawsuits threaten to uh, uh, append how the real estate industry handles commissions moving forward. If so, it will lead to a significant reduction, reduction in the number of agents, the number of brokerages, the number of MLSs, and that is... Interesting. And I think that 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 she's exactly right. She went on to say, now, is all of that a bad thing? Perhaps not, she said. Maybe we do need to clean up the house. Maybe we do need fewer individuals who are coming in and playing in our space, as opposed to being professionals in our space. But in the meantime, the implications could be substantial particularly for buyer's agents and how they make their money. Some alternative so solutions could help soften the blow. The residential real estate industry could explore other models of compensation, such as how other countries handle compensation, or how the commercial real estate industry does business between buyers and sellers. Interesting point. She said, you know, getting paid is important. None of us should be working for free. But at the same time, it's probably about time we got more realistic about our services and about how we get paid from them. Wow. All right. So lots to talk about there. 
I think what she is alluding to, and I will spend some time talking about this, is that, and I don't want to speculate, so I have no idea, right? But based on her last comment, when she says, it's probably time to get more realistic about our services, when I read that, I believe what she is saying is maybe she's saying that our services aren't worth the amount or the percentage that people pay. And I think that is a highly debatable subject. Of course, of course, it's a highly debatable subject in that if you look at the way that we are compensated, it's not that we, obviously all of you know, it's not like you get the full 6% or you get the full 3%. You got to pay taxes. You've got expenses like any other business. And so taking all of that into consideration, maybe you net, if you get a 3% commission, maybe you're netting a third of it. And so all of the work, you, you look at a buyer's agent as an example. They might, sh they might work for six months with one client and they sell them a three. Let's do the math, actually. That'll be interesting. So let's look at this. Th this is where I, I see it a bit different than, than what she is. So on a $300,000 house, at 3%, there's a $9,000 commission, right? I think an average commission split is that agents are on a 70% split, call it. So that agent gets a commission check for $6,300. Now, of the $6,300, they have to probably pay 30% in taxes. So that leaves them. So let's take out, so 6,300 times 0. 0.7. So that leaves them with 4,400. Also, they have expenses just like any other business does. And so let's say they have 30% of overhead, right? So of that 6,300, let's say that they net out of that. Let's just be, let's even give the benefit of doubt and say you, you net half of that. So $3,100 is the true net income off of one transaction that might have taken you three, four, or five months to get. Let, let's just say it took three months of work. Okay, so it's $1,000 a month. It's less than minimum wage. So it's interesting to see how, how that how she, she said that, but we'll find out. All right, let, let's talk about what some other people said about this lawsuit. So, so Jackie Soto, who's the broker of eHomes, she said, the barrier to get into our industry is very low. I totally agree. But what we are seeing and what we predict is that the, the bar will be raised and education will also be increased for our industry. Jackie, I 100% agree. I, I am so in alignment with this that there's one argument to say, yeah, just, you know, um, Everybody has to start somewhere. I, I get that argument. But I've talked at great lengths in, in other videos about people getting into the industry, the industry having an incentive to tell you just about how sexy it is and, and all the upsides. Rarely do people shoot you straight about, hey, here are the potential downsides to the business because they have an incentive to get the masses into the industry. And then as a result, you start to see consumer surveys come out and say, you know, that realtors at the bottom of the totem pole, that people don't respect us, that people are suing us left and right for the fees that we charge. Well, why is that? Because now that then becomes an unintended consequence of just let every Tom, Dick and Harry into the industry. All they got to do is take, you know, a week class and they're in our business. That low barrier to entry is... I think proving now later in life to be very, very dangerous. That if we do raise the bar, that only true professionals that are going to treat this like a true business and a true career, do we end up better? Does the consumer have a better experience? Do we have less people in the business, but the people in the business, have they're more career agents. And so you, you can be the judge of that. My thought is that if this was a professional's industry, not a industry for people that want a hobby, 
I think that is that I think that is better for the consumer. I think that is better for the industry, and I think that is better for the people that are that stay in the industry. Let's talk. Let's let's see uh, from another. Let's hear from another uh, CEO. So this is Paul. Boomsma, he's the CEO of the real estate companies, the leading real estate companies of the world. He said, I look on the commercial side in the US, which is where we probably want to go a little bit closer to if these lawsuits succeed. Typically on what we call a tenant rep side is you're representing your client. Frequently, they're in the offer, whether it's a purchase or even a retail lease or office lease they'll actually build it into the offer. And the landlord or the seller will pay the fee to the tenant rep or the buyer's rep. It's kind of the same thing that these lawsuits are pushing for. And it already is in the existence on the commercial side. It's just that the number of commercial transactions typically occur between people uh, who are more educated on the process. Yeah, I could see that. Because there's very, 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 very little scrutiny when it comes to commercial real estate. And if we move towards that, I think that potentially that might make sense. Here's another agent who leads a large team. She said, of course, the buyers must be protected. That's been an argument that that we've been talking about with these lawsuits. But also, I feel like the barrier to entry into the industry is what concerns me another industry leader concerned about low barrier to entry, which I don't feel buyers are protected if we, Florida's one of the lowest barriers entry, 63 hours of education, the lack of education or requirement for the professional industry concerns me. Another agent talking about the barrier to entry because the unintended consequence of this is the consumer doesn't feed, doesn't value our services. That's plain and simple. That's the sentiment of the entire conversation that the consumers are starting to lose, uh, uh, devalue this profession. Can, is that a result of us having a low barred entry and people treating this like a hobby? Now they always have, but it, it's not to the extent that it is now. And I think that potentially these are all just the downstream impact of that. Okay, another one. The NAR commission lawsuit, if lost, will bankrupt NAR. And that will be interesting. Is I've been talking about this for years too. If there's not a governing kind of association over the industry, and maybe we go to a world where there's self-governing boards at each company or each brokerage, or it's just more localized, what, what does that mean? Because the 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 amount of money that is on the line, yeah, I don't even know. Where, this could bankrupt not not only NAR, but it could bankrupt all kinds of association, all kinds of companies. So we'll see what happens. I mean, there, there's billions of dollars on the line. Chris Heller, go back to Chris. He says, worst case scenario, forty percent, forty to fifty percent uh, fewer agents, forty to fifty percent reduction in commissions. Net negative impact on first-time and low-income buyers. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a massive reduction. So that's essentially wiping out half the industry as his worst case. Well, that would be interesting. So, you know, and there's there, there's so much to talk about with this lawsuit. And I've made a ton of videos about that. You guys can go watch that on the channel. But let's let's get into let's get into the next topic. What they're calling life after the market correction. I'm going to go through what some of these leaders had to say and then I'm going to give kind of my take on how I see it playing out based on some of the comments that were made in this leadership roundtable. So, first off, Exit Realty's CEO, Tammy Bonnell, Encourage executives to lean on top producing real estate agents amid the economy uncertainty and warned 
that a wave of newcomers who enter the profession at a high point in the market could be undone this year. Now, I think that point that Tammy brings up is 100% spot on. If you look at the, the layout of the real estate agent licensee demographic, if you will, there have been so many people that have gotten into this industry because this industry has been hot for a while, last three, four, five years. Maybe many of you watching the YouTube channel or listening to this on the podcast you probably are, have been licensed in the last couple of years as well because the market has been so good. It's been so lucrative that it's attracted tens or I would say hundreds of thousands of people. And that really hasn't been the norm. I mean, outside of the past couple of years, we haven't seen the droves of people getting into the industry the way that we have. And the, and the thing that we have to consider and we have to look at is can those agents survive in a what, 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 what is known as a normal market? And what I mean by that is this. All of these agents that have been licensed, again, over the past, call it three or five years, they, they get all they know is they get a listing they put that listing inside of the MLS and that listing sells with multiple offers extremely quickly. And they say to themselves, wow, that's pretty, pretty simple. I wish I would have gotten into real estate a lot sooner, a lot of them say. Not knowing that that isn't normal, but to them, that is their normal. And that's what Tammy's talking about is that most of these agents, they don't even understand a normal market. They got into the industry during a period of time that we're calling a statistical anomaly. So it makes sense that a lot of these agents potentially are frustrated right now. A lot of these agents are struggling to accept and find their way in this market. And it's not necessarily their fault. They just don't know what they don't know. They only have been in this industry at its peak, at its best time ever. It's like the gold rush. So she said, top producers do better in a market shift. 100% agree with that because they know what to do and they've been doing the right stuff all along. That is 100% true. The agents that have been in this business for 10, 15, 18, 20 years, they are they had something I think is so valuable that a lot of the new agents getting into the business don't, and that is perspective. That is the ability to compare the last three to five years versus what normal was for these agents that have been in the business for a long time. And so a lot of them, not only do they take advantage of the market that we had over the last three to five years, but they understand how to move through a shifting market as well. And so here are some other leaders and what they had to say about what, what does the real estate industry look like after this market shift? So another one was for, from Laura Gottsman. She's the broker owner of Gottsman Real Estate. And she said something pretty similar. She said, the cream will rise to the top. Agents that got in the business because they thought it was easy money will be gone. Realtors will need to be sharp, educated, and on their best foot. Chris Heller, who's the chief real estate officer of OJO, said 20% fewer brokerage offices and companies. Average size of teams will grow by 25 to 40%. Interest rates will find a new range for the next decade, fluctuating between 4.5% and 5.5%. So... When, when I look at some of these comments from some of these leaders, I want to be really careful and I want to be very respectful. Because I probably have said some things in the past too to say, listen, we're getting into what we call a professional's market, which means that you actually have to have a skill set that allows you to 
get your listings sold. The days of sticking that sign in the front yard, putting that in the, into the MLS, sitting back and getting 25 offers and looking like an absolute hero are, are probably behind us. And so when I say we're getting into a professional's market, that means that we have to understand the market. We have to understand marketing. We have to understand advertising. We have to understand negotiation. We have to understand proactive lead generation. And these are all skills that, quite frankly, a lot of agents haven't had to worry about. Jeremy Crawford, who's the CEO of First Multiple Listing Service, he said, the mortgage reform is a must to solve affordability and allow for new ways to lend money. And he also talked about replacing reverse mortgages and home equity lines of credit. States without uh, without these displace fixed income owners with tax increases to the point of bank repossession and foreclosure. So he's essentially saying, listen, if we don't, if we don't go through some type of mortgage reform, we could find ourselves right back where we were in 2008, 2009, where we've got a bunch of foreclosures hitting the market. And if that were to happen, and I don't know that I agree that it will, but if we find that to happen, that will be the linchpin that unleashes a massive inventory in the market that will destroy home prices. Now, Jeff Myers, the CEO of Zonda said, we believe new homes will be a large percentage of new inventory over the next five years. Just because so many households in America are on these low, low fixed mortgages and home builders are in a great position. And I think so too. I made a video the other day doing a 2023 US housing market update and we see all the new permits and, and number of new builds and number of new construction being ready to be sold all those numbers are starting to increase once again. So all of these, all 70 of these people went around and talked and gave their opinion about this market shift that we're in and what we're gonna, what's gonna happen and all that kind of stuff. A, a lot of them are saying that mortgage interest rates probably will tend to come back down and hover somewhere between four, four and a half, five percent which I agree with. And when I say that, I have a lot of people on these videos, in the podcast, commenting, oh, you're crazy, interest rates are gonna continue to go up. Well, that probably just isn't the reality. Andrew Flotchner, who's the president of Real Scout, said by December, we should see mortgage interest rates at 4.5%. Jeremiah Taylor, who's the VP of Real Estate and Mortgage at OJO, said that... Uh, we should also see interest rates, the 30-year mortgage, around 5% by the end of the year. So 4.5%, 5%. And if that happens, again, they'll get a lot of buyers and sellers off the table. So I'll go through some, some more of these really quick. But um, the, the, the sentiment of this conversation is that people believe that mortgage interest rates are going to go down. And that a lot of them also believe, a lot of the agents that got into the business bringing the number of licensees to about 2 million real estate agents in this country, 1.6 of them, members of NAR making them realtors, a lot of them foresee that number going down. And, and that's what I was saying earlier. It isn't a, uh, it's not a, I don't think it's the industry disrespecting the people that are getting into the industry, but we see this with anything, right? Easy in, easy out. The people that got in this business and, and were making easy money that don't have the foundation, the skills in place, might find themselves struggling to earn money in an industry that requires you to have a high level of skill. It's just common sense. Now, let's move on to the next topic. The next topic this roundtable discussed was what they call real estate after the messy COVID fallout. So this is kind of how they teed it up, all right? So... Here's what they saw. So uh, an executive from Zillow believes that the real estate industry may be standing on the uh, precipice of another extraordinary transition today as the pandemic has driven consumers even more toward seamless online experiences and companies have begun to invest in the next lead generation of artificial intelligence or AI. And I'm going to be talking a lot about that in 
the next couple of days, next couple of weeks. I'll go deep on AI and, and what's happening there and, and what we have to be aware of, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So as they get into this, so I'm going to first start off with what Tim Heil said. I've got tons of respect for Tim Heil, who, who is the founder and CEO of, of Homeward. He's one of the great real estate agents uh, that have ever been in this industry. He's grown a massive team. He's got multiple different companies. Here's what he had to say as it relates to the real estate industry after the COVID fallout. He said, a lot of people are in long-term office leases. They want to make use of them. They want to bring their teams together during this crazy time of change. And I think we all sort of agreed that it would be better to be in person during this crazy time of change. And so we think a lot of companies will start to move towards that requirement to come back into the office by 2024. Not all companies are going to do it, but I think that most companies will. So that right there for me is going to, it's it's tough for me to, I could see it both ways, but I think what will, what I believe will happen is a commercial real estate, I believe is in big trouble. I think that there is a lot more on the commercial side of real estate to be concerned about than, than, than that of residential real estate because I tend to be on the opposite side of Tim. I tend to look at it differently than Tim. I, I tend to look at it like this. I, I, I agree with the fact that people need that human connection over the past couple of years of people losing some of that. But the days of these 10, 12, 18,000 square foot real estate offices and real estate agents scattered throughout the entire building, I think just are gone. When I, because there's no, A, for the real estate agent to go in there, you can argue, well, what is the value of me going in there? I'm just distracted by all these people. And then for the broker owner, the person who actually has to pay the bill, it's like I have this huge office. I have this huge expense, probably the biggest expense on my P&L, and it's a ghost town. I walk through companies right now that have these huge, fancy, sexy offices, and there's nobody there. I'm like, hello, is anybody here? And then somebody scurries out from some corner. Oh, yep, yep, can I help you? That's what I'm seeing and so I believe what will happen is, A, we do need more human connection, but I think the way in which that will manifest will be different than what we've seen in the past where a bunch of people come into an office. I think what you're going to see more and more and more and more of is a lot more virtual communities popping up where perhaps instead of you know driving to an office and fighting the commute, and dealing with all of that complexity that we jump into these virtual rooms like Zoom rooms or Google Hangouts and we check in for the day and we're, we're connecting with our team. There's high levels of visibility. There's high levels of accountability. But I think a lot more virtual communities will be the thing of the future rather than potentially driving in to an office. Okay, so some other people and, and what they had to say. So Jeremiah Taylor, who is the VP of Real Estate and Mortgage at OJO, said less than 50% of pre-COVID office occupancy. Emergence of condo conversion projects, hourly workers return to the office, knowledge workers remain highly remote. See, that is exactly what I believe. And I believe that that will just continue to happen. I just, if, if you're... There are some, some types of jobs that will require you to be in the office. However, the vast majority, and based on the numbers, I think they'll, they'll remain remote. And I think we will find different ways to connect uh, via technology. I think that's the way of the future. All right, so a couple other things. I want to just unpack. Some of these were really good. All right, so here's so here's another person, uh, another one of the executives says, realtors got too relaxed and are now wanting to work from home, making offices ghost towns, right? That's exactly what I see. So most of them are just seeing that outside of Tim, um, 
And he said another thing here too. I think at the end of the day, one of my biggest takeaways is that being in the middle um, is really hard. And when you make a commitment to one or the other, you really, really succeed. He, he's talking about um, this, this whole idea of being in office or being out of the office. And so I think that the context in which he speaks with of the person who has the offices, certainly they want people back. There's other industries that are dealing with this right now. There's a huge, massive mortgage company here in Detroit dealing with the same thing. They own billions of dollars downtown Detroit. And for the last couple of years, everybody was at home. And not only that, but the company did better than when everybody was in the office. And now they want everybody to come back to the office and it's causing all kinds of havoc. All right, let's move to the third topic. The third topic they talked about was this life after the tech, what they're calling the tech meltdown. Just a lot of these, these property uh, real estate tech companies really, really struggled. You saw iBuyers struggle, and that's just a byproduct of, of, of the real estate market. So they teed this up by talking about that it being truly the time to adapt or die for real estate tech startups, he said. The founder and CEO of Orchard told Disconnect attendees that the era of nearly free capital produced a great number of companies that will not survive this era of high interest rates and more skeptical investors. I think that there's going to be innovation forced by the real, uh, by the, by the real cost of capital. And I agree 100% with Cunningham here. I think that, again, just like we saw a lot of real estate salespeople get licensed again in, into the business, there was a massive drove of tech companies also getting into the business who saw an easy way to turn a profit. And investors jumped all over that. However, in, until recently, you saw a lot of those companies struggle. You're seeing massive tech companies laying off people, reporting massive losses. You're seeing a lot of these investors pull out. And it's very, very, very um, interesting to, to see what's going to happen with these major tech companies that people put billions and billions of dollars into investing. We're going to see what happens. So, so John Hong, he's a partner on Fifth Wall Ventures. This is what he said. I talked to many founders and entrepreneurs that do have venture capital money. It's painful to take a down, uh, a, a down round of in valuation, but really dilution is better than death. It really is about getting to the other side. Because if you do get there and no one else has made it, you kind of win by default. So this is an interesting comment. He's saying if you, the, he's speaking to the tech companies, he is also, based on his, his comment, under the belief that a lot of these major tech companies are going to fall left and right like dominoes. He's saying for the ones that make it, however, that make it through this market shift, might see them come out of the other side succeeding as a default. So we'll find out. Another CEO of a, of a major MLS service said private equity companies will start buying up companies as fire sales in the next 18 months. Brokerages that tried to be tech companies but didn't profit in 2019 to 2022 will go belly up. Companies like Compass, Open Door, Purple Brick, Knock, etc. This to me was probably the most interesting comment to make at this roundtable of 70 you know, CEOs of the biggest companies in the real estate industry. I mean, he's coming right out and saying, these companies are done. And these are all the companies that were, over the past couple of years, making all the headlines, making all the agents nervous. They were going to be the ones that come into this industry and change the way it was done forever. And now these companies, it's not just because this, this executive brought it up, but the facts are the facts. All these companies are struggling badly. I mean, they're laying off people left and right. They have investors pulling out. 
I mean, they are they're on the ropes right now. And it, 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 that will be the interesting thing to see, to see which of these companies falls first. How, how do they navigate this? Will they just outright, to his point, do some type of fire sale and just say, you know what? We throw in the towel. Somebody come buy this for pennies on the dollar. It's going to be interesting. So Roger Bolletier, the CEO of the Nova Scotia Association of Realtors. Okay, this is a big, big association. He said, companies with earnings will survive and thrive going forward. The decade of free money is over. A whole generation will have to adjust to this. Real estate investment is cyclical, and we are in a downturn. In one to three years, we will trend up again. That is an also, I, I totally agree with that as well, in that this business is very cyclical, and not only is it cyclical, but in the down. When, when things are down, here's what I here's what I've learned being in this industry for almost 20 years. That when things are down, they tend to get better quickly. They tend to rebound quickly, thankfully. And and that has been my experience. That when we've seen a market that hasn't been as fruitful, that that doesn't last as long as the times that are good. I mean, if you look again at the last three to five years. It's been phenomenal. But if you look at the times when it was bad, maybe they last a year, year and a half until things start to get better. Now, Chris, going back to Chris Heller. So I want to I talk about this too. So he's saying there's two types of companies. One that have a high degree of confidence that will survive. And then those companies that will that are either profitable or those ones that are on a path to find profitability. If a company is not in one of those two categories, they're in a really tough spot because there isn't any capital available to help them get through these, these times. And that is another really good point. Whereas before, you saw these tech companies running at losses month after month after month and still venture capitalists pumping investment into these companies. That was the only reason these companies were, were staying afloat. When that money dries up, when that money from venture capitalists goes away, again, I go back to saying how many of those companies will start to, to tumble. Andrew Bickley, um, he's the president of Constellation One. He said, companies with flexible cultures and finances will flourish. Growth needs to be a tactic, not a strategy. Meaning they actually have to do something to continue to push their companies forward from a leadership standpoint and their culture. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to give you a couple more. So Jeremiah Taylor going back to the VP of OGO, he said, "Who and how many will survive? We don't know. Homes.com will spend their way into the top 5 portals in traffic. Q2, Q3 of 2023 will be mergers and acquisitions heavily. Balance sheet businesses will private uh, to capital light options, I buyers become marketplaces and lead generation businesses. Yeah, I think that is exactly right. I think that the way in which, you know, I'm, I'm reading a really interesting book called Peaks and Valleys. And I think what Jeremiah just said is exactly what we're going to see. That all these tech companies that built their success on lead generation, and that is winning the eyeballs of the consumers, the, the Zillows and the Realtor.coms of the world, and all these other companies that generated their success through that channel of business, then dipped their toe into transacting real estate. I think we'll see a lot of them go right back to doing what got them successful in the first place. 